Thank you for joining us today on Earthbound. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kasim. Our rainwater, drinking water, weather, climate, coastlines, much of our food and even the oxygen in the air we breathe are ultimately provided and regulated by the sea. Go 14 of the Sustainable Development Goals focuses on life below water and it pushes us to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas and marine resources for sustainable development. There are so many things we get wrong about the oceans and today on the program, we look at how to right those wrongs. Do stay with us. The oceans, which cover three quarters of the Earth's surface, play a vital role in the global climate system. Generating oxygen and absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Today, more than 3 billion people depend on the ocean for their primary source of food and an estimated 40 million people worldwide are employed directly by the ocean economy. The market value of marine and coastal resources and industries is estimated at $3 trillion per year, about 5% of global GDP. Every day, our oceans contribute to poverty eradication, promote sustainable livelihoods and employment, as well as improve global food security and human health. They are also the primary regulator of the global climate and a vital sink for greenhouse gases. Despite their importance, oceans, seas and marine resources are increasingly threatened, degraded or destroyed by human activities, reducing their ability to provide crucial ecosystem services. These pieces of plastic we see here, we see a bottle, we see a spoon, we see a biro, we see nylon bags, we see bottle caps, there's even a shoe there. Every one of these has been dropped where they shouldn't have been dropped and they are causing havoc in the ocean, in our waterways. Our waterways have so much for us and it's not just us. This is an indication of the awful selfishness and the terrible greed and why we as individuals, we must change. We can no longer be doing this to nature. Whatsoever you give her, she is obliged to give it back. And if we wreck the life systems in our waterways because of God's careless disposal of rubbish, careless disposal of plastic, we will get hit hard. We already are. We already are. The amount of fish that can be caught off our oceans, in our rivers, it says dropped drastically. And the thing is, if you break down certain species, if you drive species like the turtle into extinction, then you're going to get all kinds of feedback effects that will affect other species. we got to change. The old ways are over. The new ways of caring the new ways of compassion, the new ways of feeling genuine love for each other and of course for our Creator who brought all this wonderful miracle of creation for us. That new way has to come about, otherwise we shall regret it terribly. God forbid that we do this to our children. For many years, wildlife experts have been warning that the oceans may seem endless, inexhaustible and indestructible but the truth is, they are in serious trouble. Protect the life that is under the water and you are using it sustainably, then you know you can keep coming back at the right time to catch your fish, harvest it, and make your supplies and have something to consume. But if you drag everything and you empty it, it becomes empty and it becomes a desert, not with sand, but dead. And we're already killing it by polluting the water itself. In some economic areas, they are trying to drag the ocean and remove all those uh, pollutants, even ordinary washing clothes, you are polluting the coastal environment and things like that. Nigeria is also guilty 
the oil companies have had oil spillage, escravos and all those places. The fisher folks, I mean, it took the women in the south-south to go naked to the oil company to say, look, this is where our husband fish. You've polluted it. You have not cleaned it up. Now they can't bring fish home. Now the children are starving. Their school fees cannot be paid. Blah, 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 blah. How do we get all these polluted waterways cleaned and kept clean for the blue economy? 2030 will soon be here. We're just 80 years away. Would we be able to achieve it? We will keep trying. Goal 14 of the Sustainable Development Goals focuses on how to enhance and the sustainable use of ocean-based resources through international law that will also help mitigate some of the challenges facing the oceans. Plastic waste alone kills up to 1 million seabirds, 100,000 sea mammals, and countless fish each year. Oceans also absorb about 30% of the carbon dioxide produced by humans but there has been a 26% rise in ocean acidification since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Changes to the climate brought about by increasing levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere will lead to the changes in the oceans, including sea level rise and ocean acidification, which will put marine ecosystems and coastal communities at risk. Ocean acidification, the effect that it has on the resources, on like, like the shellfish, it harms their ability to, to build shells because when the, the water becomes acidic, then definitely the material that they use to build the shells are, will no longer be there. So it affects them. Meanwhile, we are depending on these shellfishes for food. We are depending on them for economic purposes, for our livelihood. So if we do the right thing, Maybe by reducing, um, by reducing fossil fuel combustion, reducing the quantity of carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere, that now sinks into the, uh, into the Atlantic Ocean, or into our, well, our own is Atlantic Ocean, that sinks into our ocean, that becomes the uh, carbonic acid that harms these um, animals. We can say that it starts from somewhere. So if we can stop that or reduce our fossil fuel prints, our gas prints, the, 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 the way at, at rate at which we allow the, these um, gases to go into the air, that also finds its way into the waters, it's, it's a, that's the steps we can take as individuals. The problems affecting the ocean are bad news for the 3 billion people who rely on fish from marine and inland fisheries as an important part of their diet. And more than 520 million more who rely on fishing-related activities for income and food. What's more, 61% of fish stocks are fully fished. Fishing pressure is close to or at the maximum limit of what can be sustained before overfishing will likely occur and 29% are overfished, which means they are taken out of the water at biologically unsustainable levels. Less than 4% of the ocean benefits from some kind of protection. Many years ago, FAO already had a policy that gives sizes of nets that fishers can use that will allow those fingerlings to move in and out and not be caught. But because of the depletion, the fishermen, and sometimes we have fisherwomen because the South South, Elaje and others, they do fish. They don't obey the laws. And if they are caught, they are not punished. And so we've not succeeded in being able to control the usage of the right type of net. 
I know that the Federal Department of Fisheries, with their extension agent, have been preaching to the fisher folks. But the fisher folks think more about family uh, survival than listening to what can be done to protect the ecosystem. And so we are still in that chicken and egg stage of how do we get the fisher folks to try what has been suggested so that we can preserve the fingerlings for them to be able to mature before they are caught. Nations around the world identified as least developed countries often found across Africa and Asia Pacific as well as small island developing states are seen as crucial players in the fight against worsening climate change. Often communities from these regions, particularly shore-based settlements, are the first to suffer the consequences of global warming, which threatens their livelihoods. We have a long way to go. And in the Nigerian context, it is very, very serious indeed. As you can see here, we are. The background is water. Lagos particularly is a very low-lying city. The oceans are already beginning to rise. The implications for coastal cities along the West African coast, like Lagos, are more than horrendous. If this is allowed to go on much longer, there is a limit of the carbonization. It cannot go above 2 degrees. We were hoping 1.5. That threshold is gone. We're now looking that it's possibly going to go above 2 degrees and it's going to happen quite soon. Lagos is vulnerable. We, as the giant of Africa in Nigeria, we have to bring our African brothers together to speak the truth to the world. The use of disposable single-use plastic items has effectively turned our oceans into plastic soup. While it is true that not all marine garbage is plastic, current peer-reviewed research clearly indicates that plastic is the dominant material litter in the ocean, and its proportion consistently varies between 60 and 80 percent of the total garbage in the ocean. We need to uh, you know, look at it, one, as a major challenge. It's a major challenge, especially as uh, plastic gets into the sea, and you find now that uh, you know, uh, fishes are feeding on, on, on plastic. You know? And of course, this is what comes back to our various uh, you know, menu, and then of course we consume that. We have to first and foremostly understand and recognize it as a major food security challenge going forward. And of course, we have to uh, begin to look at practical you know, uh, approach uh, to it. The accumulation amount of plastic in the ocean is set to increase tenfold by 2020, with the consequences extending centuries into the future because of length of time it takes for plastics to biodegrade, resulting in calls for a global initiative to collect plastic waste floating on the sea surface. Plastic debris has now become the most serious problem affecting the marine environment, not only for coastal areas of developing countries, that lack appropriate waste management infrastructures, but also for the world's oceans as a whole because slowly degrading large plastic items generate microplastic. These are particles smaller than 1 to 5 millimeters, which spread over long distances by wind-driven ocean surface layer circulation. Growing scientific and public awareness is fueling global concern regarding the impact of plastic ingested by marine species and the accumulation of the plastics in coastal and remote areas of oceans. Predictions of how the quantity of plastic waste will increase took into account the growing industrialization of developing countries, population growth and attempts to limit the flow of plastic debris into the oceans based on waste management activities on land. The coastal zone has the most nutrient of all marine environment. Sunlight can penetrate the shallow waters above continental shelves, which means that plants can grow while the seafloor provides an anchor for many organisms. 
As a result, a number of extremely productive and complex coastal ecosystems have evolved. According to the scientific consensus of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the speed at which these changes are occurring has no parallel in at least the last 65 million years. Changes have been observed in almost every part of the ocean, with marine wildlife relocating to higher latitudes consistent with warming trends. Changes in ocean temperature are also altering the timing of key life history events such as plankton blooms and the spawning and migratory behavior of turtles, fish and invertebrates. Talking about ocean acidification, the effect that it has on the resources, on like, like the shellfish, it harms their ability to, to build shells. Because when the, the water becomes acidic, then definitely the materials that they use to build the shells are, will no longer be there. So it affects them. Meanwhile, we are depending on these shellfishes for food. We are depending on them for economic purposes, for our livelihood. So if we do the right thing, maybe by reducing, um, by reducing fossil fuel, combustion, reducing the quantity of carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere, that now sinks into the, uh, into the Atlantic Ocean or into our, well, our own is Atlantic Ocean, that sinks into our ocean, that becomes the uh, carbonic acid that harms these um, animals. We can say that it starts from somewhere. So if we can stop that or reduce our fossil fuel Prints, our uh, gas prints, the, 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 the way at, at rates at which we allow the, these um, gases to go into the air that also finds its way into the waters. It's, it's a, that's the steps we can take as individuals. An expert once said an observation looking down from space would probably believe that an invasion of Africa is being prepared in the Gulf of Guinea. The waters are full of ships. What is going on, however, is not a military exercise, they say, but a destructive race for resources. Two sectors are involved. Some high-tech vessels serve the oil industry and its offshore rigs, while giant trawlers and masses of small artisanal boats are involved in fishing. Both industries depend on resources fossil resources and biological resources respectively. The Gulf of Guinea actually, as you said, is a grand of uh, problems when it comes to the coastal related activities uh, because it's the region in the world where there is a lot of wealth, particularly mining, uh, oil and gas, tourism, fisheries and etc. Uh, the problem is coming from the fact that you know, after the independence, countries focus only on the exploitation, non-sustainable exploitation of those resources without you know, considering you know, the ecosystem approach or the fight against pollution, you know, how those resources you know, can be depleted and not being able to offer uh, the benefits and services that they were going to provide to the population in the coastal economies. So this is mainly uh, the... Um, non-appropriate planning and governance actually uh, uh, mechanisms that we didn't have you know, in the 60s which are affecting us right now. West Africa waters are estimated to have the highest levels of illegal, unauthorized and unregulated fishing in the world, representing up to 37% of the region's catch. In addition to economic losses, pirate fishing in West Africa severely compromises the food security and livelihoods of coastal communities. In order to resolve this problem, the Monitoring for Environment and Security in Africa, also known as MESA, was launched. We have succeeded in, one, arresting vessels that were in our waters that were there illegally fishing. We got them arrested from the intelligence information from the sub-region because the sub-region has created these countries into a task force 
so that we we share information, intelligence gathering together and all that. And we also share our list of fishing license. So that if a, if, if a vessel leaves Nigeria and goes to Liberia to trawl, they will check if that vessel is legally lawful to be in their waters from the list I will share with them. So it has really helped a great deal. And because of the collaboration, we've been able to um, have IMO on, my, on our, all our fishing vessels. We now have automatic identification system on all, all our vessels. We're now beginning to have transponders on our fishing vessels so that we, the officers, can view the vessels at sea to ensure that they are compliant. So this is all. The Abidjan Convention is a regional convention administered by the United Nations Environment Programme that addresses pollution, overfishing, dumping at sea, exploration of the seabed and other activities that can affect the health of marine and coastal ecosystems in Africa. The Abidjan Convention was uh, signed in the 80s and entered into force in 1984. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it came up you know, as a multilateral or regional uh, legal agreement you know, without the uh, uh, enforcement mechanisms. Enforcement mechanisms is how the um, provisions of the Abidjan Convention as a legally binding instrument you know, could be domesticated in the national legislations. This has not been the case, but right now, you know, we are working on that, you know, to come to the parliament in countries like Nigeria, Ghana, Togo, all the 22 countries from Mauritania all the way down to Africa, uh, to South Africa, to have like the proper uh, legal mechanisms, you know, so that the coast and the oceans are protected, you know, so that they can continue to providing the um, ecosystem benefits and services to not only the populations but also to the economy of the, of the whole countries. Parties also agreed to work more closely on coastal erosion and marine protected areas, including through the development of a marine protected areas protocol to assist in implementing Articles 10 and 11 of the Convention. Articles 10 and 11 require parties to take all appropriate measures to prevent, reduce, combat and control coastal erosion and to endeavour to establish marine parks and reserves to protect fragile ecosystems. Rather than coming you know, with only text, you know, convention text, uh, and say, yeah, this is going to change the world. Yeah, it's not going to change the world. We need to do several things. First of all, you know, we need to have those provisions you know, in the convention, domesticated national uh, legislation. We need to have implementation and enforcement mechanisms. And more importantly, we need to put money. If we want to preserve the cost of the nation, you have no idea how much the economic value of the Lagos Lagoon, it means a lot in terms of fisheries, in terms of tourism, in terms of energy production, in terms of just landscape, the beauty, the beauty of it. In developed countries, I would say civilized countries, the most beautiful houses are built along the shores of the lagoon. You go to Geneva, Lake Le Mans, you know, you can't afford you know, buying one square meter of land there. In London, I think they have the tunnels. In Paris, they have the scene. You know, all civilized capital, you know, those places are among the most expensive lands. But what are we doing with ours? We defecate. We have you no know, land based sources, pollutants, you know, and everything. So we need to switch. We need to rethink and see how we can apply the blue economic principles in our economies and how we can change this crisis in the governance and other adjacent waters related uh, 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 governance into an opportunity. How we turn the shores of the Lagos Lagoon as a very sophisticated touristic tourism area, you know, where people will come for leisure and etc. How do we depollute the uh, uh, Lagos Lagoon so that the fish can reproduce again and come? I know that 20, 30, 40 years ago there were plenty of fish in this lagoon. Unfortunately, you know, it's not the case anymore. How we can use, you know, the uh, Lagos Lagoon for recreative activities? What I mean, how they call, they call aquatic sports and etc. There have been time, you know, where people were doing like uh, uh, speed boats, everything, you know, you can imagine. Uh, and most importantly, we have to make sure that, you know, we exploit the Lagos Lagoon and other water courses in Africa, but keeping in mind that you know, those ecosystems are providing services and benefits. And uh, we have to keep you know, those functions 
functioning, you know, for the rest of our life. Otherwise, you know, we're not going to run into chaos that we are living right now in. That's at five for today. We hope to be back with you next week. But in the meantime, our inbox at file at channelstv.com is available for your comments and your questions. You can also view this episode or other episodes of the program by visiting youtube.com slash channelsweb. Please click the playlist menu and then at file. From me, Ayola Kasim, and the team here in Lagos. It's bye for now. <laughs>